Hi there everybody, this is Patricia Windrow, Cable Easel Time, bringing you my program which is devoted to painting and drawing from life, or from a monitor, which is what we do when we go out and shoot a scene of my choosing, and then bring it back, project it here in the studio, and it is live. So it's the best that we can do, meaning that we don't go out with a crew in the dead of winter, we can bring the scenes inside. And so here, uh, this time, it's going to be a scene from a lake, mm, well, a large pond, small lake, whichever you'd like to call it, in Brightwaters, which is on the South Shore, as you all know, uh, between Babylon and Bay Shore. And I've always called it, ever since I got here, I've always called it the Swan Lake. And there seems to be a, a lot of swans here at uh, sometimes during the year, looks like hundreds. And so this lovely spot, which is <clears throat> the subject for today, has a bridge, and it has the uh, this uh, shoreline, and it's got the bushes in the front, and a wonderful, funky-looking sort of dramatic tree over on the left, and it's what you would call the ideal composition. So, <clears throat> here we have it, laying it out in exactly the same way that we lay all the other ones out. You don't do anything without a plan, and the plan in painting is called the layout. So, <clears throat> You find the horizon line, this time the horizon line is going to be a little bit high because it, uh, it there's some interest in the foreground. So putting the horizon line, I, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I must repeat it every time I do this, I've tinted this canvas dark for purposes of transmission. And when you work on a dark background, you would lay it out with a paler tone. This is some turpentine, which has been tinted with white. So. There is the horizon line, uh, a little bit high, but that's where the lake ends. Then uh, there is a, an area just on the edge of the lake, which is another horizon line, which is where things grow. Somewhere along the line, there is a land mass in the background with trees that are in a pattern which is very similar, very particular to Long Island. Everything here is flat. Therefore, the, uh, the break in the horizon line is unlikely. However, the reflections of the water scenes that we choose are what make for the variety. Here in the foreground is a, an area where there are bushes and nice leafless um, growths of things that have uh, lost all of their green and all of their color because of the winter time. And then we have over here on the, um, on the left, is the uh, is the, the 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 dramatic tree formation, which is what uh, all people look for when they are looking for a framing a device to frame a scene in. And here is the uh, here is the the whole left side is being framed by this enormous, wonderful old gnarled uh, tree with a nice dramatic sun uh, shining on it and it is uh, it's got knots and all sorts of uh, all sorts of wonderfully interesting things happening to it there's a big a big trunk there coming out in the middle and i suppose that if you were to really investigate that tree is probably anywhere between 60 and 70 years old maybe more however the interesting part about this composition is that there's a little bridge and it is dead center so, but it's not big enough to make it um, bad to have it dead center. I don't like to put things dead center. They, uh, it's just too symmetrical. But this little bridge is small enough so that we can, in fact, have it dead center. There's some white stanchions there, and there are some uh, little things going on in the background. But for the most part, there is a suggestion of a house here. Some, some lucky people live on the edge of this lake, and there's a suggestion of a house here. But for the most part, we're going to kind of interpret this entire, uh, this entire scene 
because uh, the details are quite far away. The thing that is going to be paid attention to is the surface of the water and the foreground. We also have a nice framing thing coming on here, which is a good thing to practice for the, uh, for the uh, working of a very fine brush technique. And this is a brand new brush. I just took the price tag off it. It is made in England. Winsor Newton makes it. It's a number three scepter, and it costs $4.60, which is an awful lot of money for a small brush, but it's indispensable for this kind of work. Uh, however, as you notice, I very rarely use more than one or two brushes. I'm going to use a palette knife on this one. And the palette knife is for a reason. It's to be able to make the large areas go more quickly. Uh, however, there isn't that large an area, and I have some wonderful, nice new brushes here. This one, and I always think that it's fair to tell you how much these things cost. This is a number two, series 997. It is nylon, or acrylic, or I believe it's more than likely nylon. It is um, an indispensable brush. It's a square cut. I believe it's going to work very well. It costs $8.95. There you have it. Available in just about any department store, uh, any art store. It's called Windsor Newton, and this is uh, an essential tool. So nobody said that it was cheap, but it also is pointless to use anything that is not good quality because then you're not going to get the right kind of strokes. I'm using a quick drying MG, quick drying white with um, with some cerulean blue, a touch of this, uh, a touch of this uh, rose crimson color, because we are now in the winter time when color becomes muted because of atmosphere. Atmosphere does a wonderful thing, and it uh, gives a kind of a mauvish tone to our Long Island skies, which, are, uh, which is accomplished by adding a touch of rose color to the, um, to the blue, which is a, a base of white, of course, and uh, in this case I've used cerulean blue because the seasons change the colors of things. If I were to use ultramarine in the summertime, it uh, doesn't necessarily mean that that would be the proper color to use when the, when the uh, seasons have changed and the atmosphere is different. Um, I have, um, oh, look at that, uh, a hair from my priming brush got in there and it's time, I'm going to just lift it right out. There, yeah, maybe that'll disappear, but you can't, you, sh you really ought not to have those telltale uh, hairs stuck in the primer because uh, they'll be there forever if you, if you don't get rid of them. So, for, uh, the, uh, the need to, um, to, to pay attention to the quality of the sky is essential, especially at this time of year, because Long Island has its own very, very peculiar color scheme uh, of sky going on overhead. Um, I, I always find it very interesting to go out and paint at this time of year because, well, first of all, you, you, you have to prove that you are able to get out there and, and, and battle the elements. It is cold, and sitting in your car, uh, you sometimes tend to get pretty chilly. So I have learned to paint with gloves on, and I've also learned to paint with uh, blankets wrapped around my legs, and, uh, and uh, I do, will not paint with the motor running. Do not do it. Let me advise you right now that that is not what I'm advocating. Do not park your car and try to keep warm by keeping the motor running. I think anybody who knows anything at all is going to know that that's extremely dangerous. So, uh, yeah, whether you... If you don't want to go out and paint when it's cold and wrap yourself up in blankets in the car, don't go out at all. Uh, make an apple pie instead, but do not let the motor run. Um, uh, I've, uh, I have talked about painting winter scenes many times. It's what painters called a limited palette. It is intriguing and very, very easy to live with. Uh, it's also cheaper. You don't use the expensive colors like the greens and the pinks and the, um, and the purples. You use uh, colors that are very muted, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, browns and tans and grays and ochres are inexpensive to buy. Colors change according to price. Now there is a suggestion of some of some wind-blown clouds there in the distance. They have to be very, very subtly put in, almost not at all, and they're picking up enough of the blue that is on there already to be able to dilute the brilliance of the white, because. Um, Clouds are rarely white, uh, very rarely white. And when you see white clouds, it is the mark of the amateur. Sorry, but uh, uh, observation will tell you that 
uh, clouds have many, many colors, and one one color that they do not have, and that is white. The best, the best bunch of clouds, of course, are the ones that are apricot colored that happen in the late part of the day. Also, in this time of year, you will see that. Uh, trees and uh, and foliage have lost all their color naturally if they didn't we'd be in trouble so there is a subtle way of trying to interpret these these um, these um, distant uh, trees that are no longer green they tend to have a sort of a gray look about them as they are as they are silhouetted against the sky I never advocate putting little tiny lines to silhouette the trees that are against the sky, there is no focus in the world that would be able to pick them up individually. It has to be a sort of a general interpretation of what those trees do up against the horizon. I mean, up against the sky. They are, they are not, unless they're close to you, and that's going to happen over here in the right side of the painting when I do that tree that is in the foreground. Then, of course, you do, in fact, paint each little branch as individually as you can, interpretively, of course. But for the, but um, actually, the the color of that distant um, embankment is more mauve and more. Uh, well, it's a combination of sap green, a little bit of mauve, and all of those trees have become very dark, and so has all of that distance in back there, which. Uh, is uh, which makes for the intrigue and the ability to uh, make a wonderful color scheme uh, for these winter pictures. Uh, I don't. I don't think that winter pictures ca have ever failed. We were hoping for snow, and uh, we always hope for snow. Even though there isn't a ski resort in in sight, we uh, love the color uh, that happens to everything when the snow falls. However. You do what you can. This uh, scene was shot just this uh, just this week when the winter has decided to not really hit full blast yet. Uh, the leaves are gone, but the snow has not come, and uh, that's okay. That gives you me the opportunity to tell you how to interpret these uh, these colorless scenes because they are in fact colorless. The nice part about it is that the chunks of trees will show up more uh, definitely and then you'll get that opportunity to have those wonderful pale trunks such as you can uh, such as such as I can show you right here. These pale trunks uh, are uh, just sort of dot the dot the um, the uh, distant shots and you you know perfectly well that all of this is very cold and um, and and absolutely wonderful uh, color schemes in these winter scenes. Uh, um, let me see what's happening here over over here. These uh, these um, all of this is getting uh, kind of gray. Let me introduce just a little bit of Van Dyke brown in that distance there because um, Van Dyke brown is a wonderful. Um, rich tone to give. It has just enough purple in it to be able to give you the look that you want for these um, for these. Uh, scenes with no green foliage whatsoever. Uh, so the color scheme on this painting will be uh, tones of mauveish gray and uh, blues, uh, the water reflections, and, and then of course all whatever subtlety, little tiny things that will come in uh, um, as uh, events take place, such as the swans swimming by, and uh, maybe that bridge in the distance, and the suggestion of a house. There is, I believe, Su suggestion of a house over here, just the the shape of the house, and and no more than that because there's going to be foliage in front of it. You don't want to you don't want to make a point of the house because what what this is is a landscape, and if you're going to have a whole bunch of houses, it looks like a real estate ad. So I just try try to sort of indicate that there is maybe maybe human habitation there, but nothing nothing overt and um, obvious. So uh, with with a with a sort of a of a uh, tree intersecting that uh, house, it, it will give you the idea, it'll give you the information that there's, there's a house back there, but it isn't, and maybe a little window or something, but certainly no more than that. You don't want it to look like a, you don't want it to look like a house ad. Uh, I'm going to take a short break in just a few moments so that I can uh, regroup my brushes here that seem to have gotten in some terrible disarray, so don't go away, I'll be right back.
are back again. Nice short break. And let me go on to the business of this distance here across this pond. Uh, there is a there is a nice uh, evergreen that is going to be that can be inter uh, uh, interpreted very very simply. We just want a slight a slight suggestion that there is a green tree growing back there and maybe another one over here because uh, they are so far in the distance <clears throat> that to make a real point out of them is, <clears throat> is not a good idea. And there is also the, um, the there is the uh, pale green uh, that seems to still, even though everything has, saw, has lost its color, there are still some, the lawns hang on. So we have managed to be able to breed a rather remarkable type of grass that will, uh, that will hang on uh, in the dead of winter and still be green <coughs> when you don't expect it to be. So there is uh, some, uh, there is some, uh, some color <coughs> in this uh, picture in the uh, in the green <coughs> that is surrounding the lake the uh, the lake has got a dark area <coughs> along all its edge i'm going to clear my throat once and for all along the edge here and then the uh, the bridge of course you can see the underside of the bridge uh that's quite dark but it's and it's very very small but it must be there nevertheless because um the uh, the anatomy of the bridge is one of the reasons that uh, that this uh shot was done uh the bridge seems to be uh, white but it isn't it's a, a kind of an off white there in the distance and the stanchions uh, stand up rather sharply against the dark of everything else but the little bridge can be put in just in a few subtle um uh, just to make sure that the shape of the bridge is clear, because it, the, the bridge is very identifiable with its with its very gentle span. It is um, if you didn't make the bridge this shape, uh, people would say, "Where is that?" Um, anybody who knows this pond knows that this is the shape of the bridge, and one must be faithful to the shapes of things, especially when they're as obvious as that. There are four stanchions, uh, two on either side. This one is the wrong place. Let me change that. Okay, get rid of that other one. Get it out of there before it confuses everything. Good. You see, oils uh, enable you to correct your mistakes. One of the reasons that I work in it. I am no fool. I know that you can make mistakes and that you have to be able to correct them. Underneath the bridge, there is a wonderful, brilliant, uh, uh, apparently the water keeps going back here behind this bridge, and you, you see the brilliance of it uh, directly underneath that dark span, which makes it for, makes it able to be very visible. Um, there is a little bit of, uh, there's a little bit of a shadow on this, on this stanchion, so, the, so that'll, uh, the anatomy of these things, even though they're very far away, have to be accurate. So, uh, and even though they're just a little dab of the brush, it, it tells, it tells all the story that it needs for it to be a good reporting. Painters are, after all, reporters. I see that uh, the sky is showing through a, a, a few areas here where the trees are not completely uh, dense, and so uh, you try to interpret that also, that those trees back there uh, do let some of the sky in because of the lack of foliage. Now, um, as we as I as I progress along, I'm going to I'm I'm going to run the uh, I'm going to run the shoreline here with. Um, a rather interpretive kind of uh, color scheme because it, it is it is difficult to see and it's barely visible to to anyone who is this far across the pond, but it never it, but it is definitely uh, an area by the edge of the uh, by the edge of the pond that has that has a dark space and then the, and then there seem to be some small evergreens that are growing. Uh, on the edge, uh, on the edges of this uh, of this pond, and those have to be uh, j they c those can just be put in very subtly. Uh, naturally, I'm, I don't work with an enormous brush. I work with a reasonable brush, a brush that I can that I can uh, handle and make it do what I want it to do. The uh, <coughs> the other business of using oversized brushes is absolutely pointless. You 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 can't possibly get the effect that you want with the great big brushes. Now. The sky, of course, is reflected in the mirror of the lake, and um, it, at this particular moment, when this it was shot, the uh, the sky was extreme. The um, the mirror was extremely brilliant, and it was running directly across through the trees, uh, reflecting the paleness of the sky, almost in a band, uh, a ribbon. Um, 
When you're working out there in life, you uh, fr from life, uh, and this monitor is about as close as I can get to that, it will tell you that all of this is, uh, is the way it's happening. It does change, and when it changes, you have to accommodate and change with it. However, if you've done something that is quite good and very acceptable with that first try, no matter whether the wind changes and, and, and the surface of the water has become different, leave, the, leave what you had the first time. But there's always the possibility that when the wind changes you'll get an even better effect so you, so one has to be prepared to change that uh, to change that surface t uh, texture uh, over here um, I believe that I uh, that the the, the uh, something is disturbing the water here and therefore it's darker over here all of this is only possible if you're there to observe it it can't possibly be gotten out of a book a magazine or even out of your imagination it has to be you have to be there to see it or at least uh, use the remarkable thing called the camcorder if you own one and people do most people do they can go out you can go out and you can record these things and and then come back and play them on your own set and, and do exactly the same thing that is happening here in the studio. Uh, there is no a reason to assume that you can't. I see that there's a, a nice dark streak that has now suddenly found its way through there and I think I like that because it's, it, breaks up, it breaks up an otherwise uh, unexplained uh, pale surface. And I think the more that you can get in the way of, of uh, texture, the better. I suppose it continues on that side as well. Um, the, uh, as, as, as I progress, I'm going to use this palette knife here, technique here to, to, um, to cover this large surface of the water towards me. And it also means that it's a background color for me to be able to um, go back there and put some, uh, s some uh, texture on the top. Uh, in other words, layer paintings. So, uh, as you can see, when the palette knife goes on, and, uh, and I hope that the, um, the reflections aren't too, uh, aren't too distracting, uh, the, the, um, the palette knife technique, which is uh, something that I think is probably one of the more interesting ones, uh, enables you to work out of doors very quickly. It's not just that I need to get a lot done here in the studio, but when you're out of doors, you are, you are uh, battling time, uh, as usual. So uh, here is, um, let me get my big, uh, big fatter brush here. Uh, this, is, uh, this one has no price on it because I've lost it, but it's a great big uh, heavy bristle and it, it is going to be able to smooth out and, make, uh, and, um, and give me the technique that I want here for this water. Let me, let me hold this easel. When you're, when you're working with such enormous amount of energy, your easel tends to, um, tends to shake somewhat. But that's no different than being outside because the, uh, guess what shakes outside? The whole wind shakes everything when you're out of doors. Um, and here, with, uh, with probably uh, any luck at all, this, uh, the surface of this water is not going to change that much in the next few minutes. But if it does, we'll be ready to accommodate. And then maybe I can show you the, uh, the, the really wonderful uh, possibilities with the palette knife. Those swans that you see, um, we will try to isolate them uh, a little bit later uh, on the tape so that I can maybe really give you a feeling about what I have always called Swan, Swan Lake. Uh, it, 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 it has a name. It is in bright waters. I'm not quite sure of, of, the, of, the, of its given name, but it has one, I'm sure. Uh, and as you can see, the swans are there in great numbers. The, um, and the tree, which is, uh, I'm going to be doing that with a different kind of brush. The tree um, uh, over here uh, on the right side is um, apparently a, uh, a deciduous tree of some sort. And it has a rather nice, very typical uh, deciduous tree pattern to it. And I'm going to, this is where a little bit of technique or a lot of technique comes into play. You have to be able to uh, run, your, um, run a single line as best you can down so that you get a, uh, a nice, well, uh, the technique is called uh, a, a, a nice uh, continuous uh, flow, a stroke. And uh, the, it, it, this is what takes the practice, and it ought to be uh, top on the agenda for anybody who is wishing to paint, to try to do, get these um, nice 
strokes, uh, uh, well, mastered, I suppose is the word, to make sure that you can, that, that when you're out there, you will understand exactly how to run, how to ha handle these things. Uh, the 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 little the, the single masterful stroke on a, on a on a tree is is uh, is is vital to first of all the the um, well the uh, the freshness of it you have it has to be it has to be a fresh approach and you have to be able to have the kind of technique that is going to in, that is going to interpret let me get that nice fine one that I told you about before. Uh, also, uh, the um, the business of understanding that twigs uh, get thin at the end and are fatter uh, as they as they grow. Um, many times, you will find that um, that is not paid attention to, and the twigs are fatter at the end than they are at the beginning of them. And so, all of these things are are, are observations which are which are vital to true landscape painting in its in its in its most realistic form. Um, this tree is vital to the composition. It occupies the entire right side of the canvas. It is to be it is to be treated with a, uh, with um, as much design information as possible, and also as much accuracy as possible. I don't suggest that you must take every branch and interpret and, and paint it, but certainly to give the illusion that there is a great thicket of branches here, and that they are uh, in the summertime. This tree will be totally obliterating the sky and therefore it's a very full tree. Whatever whatever nice things happen over the water by all means do it and if you run into a background like this which is too dark you must lo uh, deepen the value of that branch so that it will show against the um, against the darkness. It, the, the value of the branch will change against the sky as it does uh, it change against the darker background of the um, of the land mass in the in the rear. So uh, the fact that a gray branch is taking place up here and that you think that it's the same gray, it isn't. It's slightly darker to accommodate the fact that it is against the darker background. Uh, I can probably think about refining these and making them a, a lot more uh, a lot more thick and a lot more profuse uh, later, but for the most part this is about all we need, but we also need to show you how to put in a slight highlight. It has to, the, the highlights will not run the full length of the branch no matter what the other programs tell you that the whole side of the branch, no, it is in subtle, it is in subtle areas it, and, it, and it breaks and stops because another branch branch will cast a shadow so you do not run the uh, the highlight all the way down the uh, all the way down the branch or all the way down the tree in one line it's not possible it has to be broken it, it observation will tell you that none of that is uh, is possible it's just an invention and it's irritating when you see it happen. So just the size, certain sides of the branch and certain places are going to catch that light. The rest of them is going to be in shadow. Even Maybe even sometimes they disappear into absolutely nothing. So well, once again, I'm, I'm, now, I'm now getting picky about small things. And um, so be it, that's me, picky about small things. Good. The, um, the big tree in the uh, in the uh, on the left side is now going to be the next quarry for me to to uh, to handle and that is probably going to be only the beginning because the program uh, this part of the program this is part one of this study is going to take place is going to come to an end now and then the rest of it will take place in another program so as long as I have gone that far, I better close because time has in fact run out. Please tune in the next time we do part two of this Bright Waters Pond to find out how the tree comes out. This is Pat Windrow uh, saying thanks for watching and bye-bye. <laughs>